Good evening. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education in Baltimore County for Tuesday, November 20th. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then remain standing for a moment in silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, So good evening, are there any changes, additions to tonight's agenda, Ms. White? There are no changes or additions. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Yes, Ms. Miller. I move that the board add an agenda item to discuss the modification of the motion to protect system records from destruction. Second. Very good, does anyone want to speak to that? Uh, I have spoken to it uh, at every meeting since um, September 25th. Okay, let's have a vote by a show of hands, all in favor. Uh, the motion fails. Our next item is item D. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, we're doing minutes of closed session. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, uh, resignation or performance evaluation of appointees, employees or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with the council to obtain legal advice and or eight, consult with staff, consultants or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of the closed session are inf and informational summary can be found on our website, bcps.org slash board slash informational summaries .html. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to speak uh, and to address the board. The completed sign-up cards this evening have been placed in this box and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who signed up will be permitted to speak. That's the point of order, Mr. Chairman. If you could please introduce our new student board member for this evening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, his commitment to education and lifelong learning is exemplary. <laughs> Indeed. Our first speaker this evening is Bosch Ferron. Our second speaker is Kevin Leary. Our third speaker is Jim Melia. Our fourth speaker is Diana Bergman. Our fifth speaker is Heather Greninger. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And that's all we have in the box. Very good. We shall move to item E, which is our special order of business for tonight's agenda. So the Board of Education publishes the comprehensive annual financial report and each year student artwork is included in this CAFR. The fiscal year 2018 CAFR includes the work of secondary school students and these students are recognized at the board meeting when the CAFR is presented to the board. Each student selected receives a gift card to Barnes and Noble and the following student's artwork was selected. Our first student from Middle River Middle School is Excellence Arbe Arbeasola. How do we pronounce your name? Okay, very good. Our, our second student uh, from Golden Ring Middle School is Caden Battle. 
Our third from Franklin Middle School is Caitlin Clark. Our fourth from Golden Ring Middle School is Daphne Domingo. Next is Perry Hall Middle School, Daphne Fang. Uh, also Northwest Academy of Health Sciences, Eric Garcia. And Lansdowne Middle School, Kirsten Kashlak. And we, we need all of them to come forward for some recognition. <laughs> yes, very good. And thank goodness for their artwork because the reading the Kaffir is not the most enlivening thing on earth. All right, uh, our next item for this evening is a public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. And as appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate, and I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I now call our advisory groups to speak. Our first advisory group speaker is Abby Baton. Good evening. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> Good evening. You and me both. <laughs> I was going to say chairman, but vice chairman. Uh, it doesn't, it just says, says Gillis up there. <laughs> uh, vice chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. Since tonight is the last time this board will be meeting, and the future board will be made up of some current board members, but mostly new board members, I wanted to thank all of you for your service to the citizens of Baltimore County. You have given tirelessly to our communities to help BCPS work to educate our most precious, precious resources, our children. I would also like to make some suggestions to the incoming board. I know that if they're not here tonight, they're probably listening. The pace of change and in new initiatives has been at an astound, astounding rate. This speed has not allowed for the staff nor students to absorb and fully utilize all the changes. At times, the sheer number of initiatives has been lost in the fray. Before any new substantive changes are to be implemented, we need time to work through those initiatives already in place to ensure we have used them to the full benefit and determine what does and what does not work. Change is a necessary part of life. 
We must change or face the danger of stagnation. That, however, does not mean we need to change everything. In other words, we don't need to change for change's sake, but for the real, in-depth, well-thought-out reasons. Just like any other new job, before you can effectively make changes, you must understand all that is happening currently. That can't be accomplished in a few weeks or even a few months. Please take the time necessary to survey the landscape and determine where we are as a school system before you jump into any other changes. We teachers are looking for some consistency to be able to learn what we already have in front of us. That consistency will go a long way in helping us do our best work with our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is PJ Schaefer. Good evening, members of the board, Ms. White. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm PJ Schaefer. I'm the past chair of the CCAC. I also have uh, a son who attends Newtown High School in Baltimore County. Uh, for CCAC, we'll be talking about two topics tonight. One is board certified behavior analysts, and the other is special education paraeducators. Um, for historical perspective, I think I made my first pitch to the board um, asking to hire um, BCBAs when um, Dr. Harrison was still the superintendent. And here we are again, still doing the same thing every year. Um, I'd first also like to recognize and acknowledge um, and thank the Board of Ed and Interim Superintendent White um, for the advocacy increased special education staffing in the past year and acknowledge that we've gone from three to six BCBAs now on the BCPS staff. Um, for those of you that don't know, Board Certified Behavior Analysts, or BCBAs, have specialized training in the principles of Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. Um, and they, supply, they apply those principles to improve the academic, social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes of the individuals whom they provide services to. The Office of Special Ed has hired one BCPA during the 2016-2017 school year. Two more BCPAs were added in the 17-18 school year, and now three were added in the 2018-19 school year. BCPS continues to see a steady increase in the number of students identified with autism, emotional disability, other health impairment, developmental delay, with increasing complex needs. The Board Certified Behavior Analyst, BCBA, will help develop ABA programs for appropriate students, supervise behavior aids, implementing ABA programming, provide supports to infants and toddlers, provide ongoing training and support for school personnel. BCPS, BCBAs have been instrumental in working with school-based teams to shape behaviors and to and more, um, uh, to, excuse me, to shape behaviors, uh, more pro-social behaviors, and by supporting IEP development, providing indirect services, and facilitating some professional learning. Specifically, the IEP development, they have provided data collection, analysis, progress monitoring. They've developed functional behavior assessments and behavior intervention plans. They've provided support to access of instruction. They've provided student-specific training. They've also provided indirect service to 128 students at 66. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeanette Young. Good 
Good evening, Board of Direct a Board. My name is Jeanette Young. I come to you tonight. I'm the newly elected president of ESPBC, the Education Support Professionals of Baltimore County. So I'm basically here tonight to introduce myself and extend my hand in working with each and every one of you who will be remaining to thank each of every one of you who have are leaving tonight and get letting you know who I am so I can know who you are. So tonight I thank you for your support, extending your hand and working with me. Thank you. Very good, congratulations. Our next speaker from Case is Tom DeHart. Good evening, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, and members of the board. So here we are at the last board meeting in November, and the meeting that I'm sure at least some of you have been eagerly anticipating, the final one. On behalf of Case, I would like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for your service to the students, parents, BCPS employees, and the community at large. Martin Luther King Jr. said life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Each of you has fully answered that question. While maintaining careers and being active with your families, you have dedicated yourselves to serving with honor and dedication uh, to this board in a role that too often is thankless. I'm sure the general public does not realize the commitment and sacrifice that each of you have made in your service to the board. These twice monthly meetings are simply the tip of the iceberg to the dozens of hours each week that you spend in your role. Subcommittees, hearings, retreats, endless emails and phone calls, and homework preparation are but a few of the other commitments that you have. It's been said that service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Members of this board, I would suggest that your rent is paid in full. Thank you very much. Ms. Causey and Ms. Hinn, congratulations on your recent election to the next board. We look forward to your experience and leadership. And Case would like to wish everyone a happy and healthy Thanksgiving with family and friends. Thank you very much. Our first public speaker for this evening is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Last time I could say that. Happy holiday to all of you, and thank you really for your input and for some of you staying. Uh, I know I really could not do what you are doing, meeting twice a, a month and so forth. So holidays are really special time. And I always came to you and asked you for equal holidays. The fact is, the school system for 23 years closed on the Jewish holidays without a secular reason and refused to do the same thing for Muslim holidays or anyone else. And although I applaud in a sense that in this coming proposed calendar that the Jewish holidays would be a professional day. However, my concern, as I stated before, that it would be used as a source for counting absenteeism and making absenteeism as indicator of the religion of the person. This has been raised several times in calendar committee. Um, I hope the board would make it clear Absenteeism on that day or any other religious holiday is not an indication of the religion of the person. It's really a poor indicator. So I always asked you for equality. You know, I started in February 2004 coming to you and speaking almost in every board meeting. And I yet to see one Muslim teacher being appointed to the school system introduced by the superintendent. I haven't seen anybody who Hindu or Sikh or Buddhist. Um, this is really a drastic difference between the diversity of Baltimore County and the lack of diversity in the teacher population. Why this is important? It's important if you are African Americans, 
You know, you want to have a teacher who is looking like you, Latinos, the same thing. Muslims, the same thing. Jewish, the same thing. It's about equality. And I really think that's something that needs to be addressed. I may have, in 15 years, made an error one way or the other, so I take this opportunity to apologize to you if I did. Nonetheless, my reason is really because I want my kids to be equal, my grandchildren to be equal. That's what's important. I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Leary. Good evening, and uh, let me be first thank you for allowing me to come here just about every meeting this year and speak to you about these issues. Um, I appreciate every one of you listening to me and all of your public service that you do, and I hope that you continue your public service after you leave the board. And those of you who are going to stay, congratulations, and I look forward to working with you in the next year or four years or however long it takes to get these things fixed. Um, I spent this afternoon and this evening talking to several people um, about suicide prevention. Um, we in our community in Perry Hall had a tragedy this weekend and in eastern Baltimore County at EVT we had a tragedy last week. Both could have been prevented um, by people just reaching out and talking to these people and these and and allowing them to express their concerns and their feelings to try to give them some help so i come to you tonight and i ask for um some help i just want to help the board of education of baltimore county and um, i worked with uh where I spoke with the Josh York Legacy Foundation, who's working with EVT as we speak um, to try to do a program at the school for suicide prevention and bring in some suicide prevention professionals to speak to the staff and the students to try to help people recognize the warning signs. Um, when he told me that he was working with Perry Hall High School as well, I was very happy he reached out to them this week. Um, but what I would like to do is try to make that a countywide program, not just the two schools that were affected, because I think we can save a lot of kids. Too many children are taking their lives because of whatever issues they have with home, at school, or whatever. And, and we, as community leaders, need to be at the front line to try to help recognize the problem and help them to get the help that they need before they choose a permanent solution for a temporary problem. And um, I hope that the new board and I and the Josh York Fa Legacy Foundation and Parent to Parent Network can all work together and get this done. And um, again, thank you for your service and, and for letting me come here every Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Jim Malia. Good evening, Jim. Hello. <clears throat> Over the past two years, I fell into a position of advocacy for a new Lansdowne High School. It happened quite quickly, quite suddenly, and I was allowed to stand before this board and speak, speak as a citizen while employed by this very body. And that's an amazing thing. During this time, I met some amazing people who are willing to listen and willing to help. I met with parents, board members, county council members, even the governor. In hindsight, I do believe that although there was not always agreement, and at times there was an emotional disagreement, 
that each person gave me their best. I believe that through this process, through each step, there was careful consideration and thought by every individual involved. And this point alone is appreciated more than you will know. As the current board concludes its business, I want to thank each and every one of you for this thoughtful dialogue, and I want to thank you for your service. And as for the new board, I look forward to your vision, your ears, and your guidance as you get ready to make the important decisions that will impact the education of the students of Baltimore County. Thank you, and enjoy your holiday. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you to each and every one of you. Even if I gave you a hard time here and there, um, I do agree. You guys did try your absolute best to come up with the solution with a lot of different advocacy issues. So thank you so much for your effort for the last four years. And I want to say to the new board that's coming, I hope you have your listening ears on. If I could get my phone to work. There is something important that I think we need to focus on moving forward. And it's regarding our morale in Baltimore County Schools. From our supporting staff to our bus drivers, our attendants, our special education specialists, our teachers, um, our aides in the classroom, every inch that makes Baltimore County one team um, for BCPS. We need to really focus on motivating each other to improve, to make a better school district for Baltimore County and improve that morale. Um, I think children feed off the environment and that positivity and that's always good for them. We've had a couple tragedies um, and I wanted to share this information that's important. If you need help or know someone who does, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline can be reached at 1-800-273-8355. Again, that number is 1-800-273-8355. And I look forward to the future and seeing all of you around in Baltimore County. So thank you so much and happy Thanksgiving. Our next speaker is Heather Gruinger. You'll correct me where I'm wrong. Yeah, please, thank you. Good evening. With this being the final meeting of the current board, I'd like to thank each of you for the time that you've given to BCPS. We all know that this has been a difficult year or two for our system. In that light, I'd also like to thank those of you who have put forth a great deal of effort to turn this train around. We often hear catchphrases like, safety is our number one priority and people for our people. However, actions and decisions both on the school system and of this board have not always reflected those words. A handful of board members have tried, often against great opposition, to keep pushing those priorities back to the top. I have no doubt that there are very knowledgeable, very wise, and very well-meaning people leading our school system. And still, there is a reason that we have a board of education, and it is not to rubber stamp things. If there is a matter that requires board approval, the board owes it to everyone involved to fully review and even question that item to put in the work. Otherwise, there would be no need for a board. Again, I want to thank those of you who have done just that, and when it was not, even when it was not well received by your fellow board members. Your dedication to our children, our teachers, and our staff has not gone unnoticed, and I can't wait to see what will be accomplished in the coming years, due in no small part to your contributions. Thank you. Would you say your name for us? Heather Gruninger. Very good, thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our public comment portion of the evening. Our next item in, is item G, 
unfinished business related to the proposed 2019-2020 school calendar. I uh, welcome Dr. Mayo. And as Dr. Mayo is coming forward, I've asked Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke to uh, bring the calendar back to the board for two reasons. Um, in accordance with um, policy and rule 6301, a school calendar must be adopted each calendar year. And um, number two, the rule outlines the adoption to occur in November for um, mainly for planning purposes, not only for staff, but also for families uh, so that they can have adequate time to make arrangements. And so although uh, we haven't received any questions from the board, I know that we put some information in the weekly update. I do recall uh, some questions from the last meeting um, pertaining to the school day task force. So. I'd like for the board just to keep in mind as we um, have discussion tonight that if we should add the additional uh, time to the school day, that additional time would uh, allow us to include more professional development and perhaps more inclement weather days, um, but it should not significantly impact the calendar that is um, before you, the substance of the cal calendar that is before you. The additional time however, um, must be negotiated with our bargaining units and also must be um, approved in the budget process, as you know, by our county council and county executive. So I'd like the board to keep in mind that if tonight's uh, um, calendar is approved, it can be approved with a contingency, uh, that if it is adopted, that it can be amended, and that is according to Superintendent's Rule 6301. So with that, um, I know that Dr. Mayo is here for any questions that you might have. Good, and just as a preface to our conversation, would you mind speaking to the reason why adding an additional 15 minutes does not substantively affect our ability, or rather our days open um, and clarifying whether for this board it is a mandate of law that we be open 180 times out of the year for at least three hours a day as well as a second requirement which is the overall total hour requirement or is it just about the total hour requirement good evening everyone um, the requirements by state law it's actually 180 um, school days for students as well as 1170 hours so we have to meet both of those requirements. So to the extent that we added 15 minutes to our contracts with our teachers and then to our school day, it does not affect our need to be open 180 times out of that year. Is correct. that correct? correct? So we would use that additional time, as Ms. White just said, for additional snow days and for potentially additional professional development. Is that correct? It could be, for, yes, that's correct. Okay. So to the extent that we did reach a contract with an additional 15 minutes, we would have the ability to modify, but that modification pursuant to the governor's executive order, its effect would be limited to increasing snow days and um, professional development days. Correct. Is that an accurate recitation? Yes. Do, this, do board members understand that? Okay. All right, let's proceed. Do you have a presentation for us or is it just about question just time because we had the presentation? Again, yes. Okay. Are there questions for Dr. Duke, Dr. Mayo? Ms. Causey. Good evening, thank you for uh, coming uh, to be available for questions and Mr. Duke also. I've been um, consistent on this issue that I will not be voting to approve this calendar. We've been discussing for over a year and apparently it was uh, uh, recommended to us uh, by the state board even further along past than that that we add 15 minutes to our school day, not just to deal with the inclement weather days, but also so that we would have a level playing field for our teachers providing instruction and for our students learning that is consistent with the rest of the state of Maryland. In addition to that, while I understand uh, your comments about there can be limited changes, I do note that Howard County, for instance, does have a full spring break on its calendar for the 2019-2020 uh, school year. And that's one of the things that the, our um, TABCO folks have talked about is very important. We've heard from parents that that's very important to have. So that's one of the things too that I've been consistent about having this calendar that we approve really try to incorporate that. And I believe that we can do that. Um, and also um, if there's time to modify it, there's time to approve it completely 
later. So I won't be voting for it. I understand that people need to plan, but I don't think it's helpful to give them a, an erroneous sense of what that plan is. So I appreciate your comments and I appreciate your being here tonight, but I'll be voting no and I'm looking forward to working with the new board members and staff uh, to get that 15 minutes paid for. I've also been consistent in saying that we need to make that commitment to our teachers to pay them extra, again, to become competitive with salaries around the state of Maryland. So uh, for many reasons, this calendar is inadequate, and in my opinion, and I look forward to working on it with the new board. So I'm, I'm not sure there was a question there, but I will ask one because I think it relates to that, which is do you want to opine upon the differences between our proposed calendar and the proposed calendar of any other system, including Howard County, or the difference, different um, factors that we're weighing? We would have to review any other school system's calendar. And okay. of course, right now they have more hours, um, well, a longer school day, I should say. Right. Um, and then also have to take into consideration other variables such as holidays they may um, have on their calendar. So that's something we have to take a look at more closely. And we their professional development does. Right. Ms. Young. Not necessarily a question for um, Dr. Mayor or Mr. Duke, but since we're going to look at other system calendars, uh, let's look at an issue that Baltimore City ran into last year where they did have a full week of spring break and then exhausted that time due to weather and had to turn around and modify their calendar and be open on days that they were initially closed. So this calendar is looking at 180 days. It takes into account only three snow days um, and professional development. So it's given the current limitations, the best workable solution. I do believe that the committee to weighed all of those various factors and, and took all of those factors incredibly seriously in terms of the inclement weather days, the, the holidays, looking at the professional development days as well. And so again, um, it would be, uh, it, if we could approve it tonight, and this is why the staff is bringing it back tonight, um, particularly with the contingency. Again, we want to make sure that we're doing things in order so that we're not getting ahead of our negotiations, we're not getting ahead of our budget season. Uh, we know that the County Council, for instance, approves a budget in May. We find that that might be incredibly late um, to let families know um, where we stand with the calendar without a uh, an approved calendar and we would be in violation of our own policy so again I just wanted to bring it back tonight uh, for your consideration um, because we would like to have a calendar on the books that our families could start planning from and uh, not having to necessarily take back days but to maybe add days if we are given that opportunity should the the budget be approved but again not getting ahead of the negotiations that would have to happen as well Ms. Causey Thank you for that commentary. Uh, just to point out, this board has made uh, votes in January and February for millions, at one point, $205 million contracts for laptops in the January timeframe because there was an agreement ahead of time with the county funding partners. So again, I am have been consistent that we need to make a commitment to our teachers and if this calendar needs to be approved, we need to make that commitment to the teachers. That's not getting ahead of the negotiations. That's putting in proper order the commitment of the board to the teachers and uh, to the additional time and to the additional funding. So Dr. Clearly, Mayor, we will need to work it out with, we have a new county council coming in December 3rd, a new county executive who have uh, made commitments to education. So I look forward to working with them um, along these lines. Dr. Mayor, we are in process or will be in process of negotiating the additional 15 minutes along with everything else that would be good. with our partners, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that you've heard from this board that it would like to see done, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, for the record, I'd like to evidence that that's in fact uh, a commitment to our teachers and a commitment to our system of trying to uh, go through the proper process and get their input on the process as we proceed uh, in due course. Uh, let's just go ahead and, and have the vote and uh, move on. So uh, I will make a motion um, to adopt the proposed 2019-2020 calendar with the uh, contingency that to the extent an, addition, uh, an agreement is reached to add an additional 15 minutes that the calendar will be revisited and revised at that time. Do I have a second? Second. Very good. All in favor, please raise your hands. 
All right, motion fails. Our next item is item H, which is new business, and that's just Dr. Mayo. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Hey, under new business personnel matters, I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, and resignations. Okay, do I have a motion to approve uh, the personnel matters as presented in exhibits H1 through H2? So moved. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The vote carries. I believe that allows us to move on to item I. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Mr. Nussbaum, your turn. There actually wasn't any action taken in closed session, so I can check. Okay. <laughs> ne never you mind. All right, so we proceed to item J. Item J, which is a, um, the watershed public charter school matter, and this is the contingent approval uh, of the watershed public school. Good evening. Good evening, um, Vice Chairman uh, Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. I'm um, Mary McComas, and I'm joined this evening by Dr. Adams, um, as you indicate, to bring forward to the board for a vote on contingent approval of watershed uh, public uh, watershed charter school in compliance with the Maryland State Board of Education's directive. Okay. So I note that there was discussion earlier among the board and its uh, council as it relates to this order. Uh, unless I hear further questions or discussion that's necessary. Ms. Miller, please go. I just wanted to express a, a desire that the new board and the, well, it will really be the system working with the uh, watershed group um, does their utmost best to come to uh, an agreement in the uh, time frame that specified. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the order for contingent approval of the watershed public school? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, all but Mr. Birch, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item K is our work session report for the evening, which is our 2018 CAFR and single audit. Oh, and um, let me note that we are hearing from Mr. Yulfelder in the first instant, instance uh, on this matter as he is the audit committee chair. Thank you. Um, the comprehensive annual financial report, CAFR, is prepared annually in compliance with public school law of the state of Maryland. All funds and accounts of the board are included in this CAFRA. While the board is an entity created and governed by state law, it has been defined as a component unit of Baltimore County government for financial reporting purposes. The financial statements for fiscal year 2018 have been audited by Clifton Larson Allen in accordance with state law. The independent audit report is included in the financial section of the CAFRA. As required of a condition of receipt of federal grants, a single audit is also uh, prepared and we have that report. Uh, on November 13th, uh, Clifton Allen Larson, Clifton Larson Allen, rather, the, board, the, the board's external auditors met with the audit committee and presented uh, their audit report. It was discussed and pleased to say that uh, the audit report has an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of assurance that an auditor can give. And at the same time, we received a single audit report, uh, which is on federal grants, for which there were no findings. And so therefore, uh, a representative, Ms. Sherry's here this evening, and prepared to answer any questions that anyone has relative to the reports. Very good, thank you. Um, we welcome, is there a presentation that you have to be prepared uh, or is it just no, questions? No, I'll just direct uh, the board's attention uh, in the financial statements to the top of page 22 uh, where uh, the auditor's opinion is expressed that these statements fairly present our position according to uh, generally accepted accounting principles and uh, at the top of page four of the single audit that uh, our, uh, uh, we have complied in all material uh, respects with uh, federal grant requirements. Understood. Do we have questions from board members? 
No, I'd, li I'd like to. I'd like to note that the um, single audit is is an audit of all federal funds for which the year under uh, under audit was I think ninety four million dollars. I don't have the report in front of me, and the largest component of that was our food uh, and nutrition program with about one third of the total, and um, it's it's a remarkable uh, program that we have feeding literally millions of kids in Baltimore County. So I'm very proud to say there were no findings. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is item L, which is our work session report on the Maryland accountability system. Dr. Brown, welcome. And as, uh, as Dr. Brown is coming forward, um, as you may know, the state of Maryland has adopted a new accountability system as part of the state's implementation of the new uh, ESSA regulations. And if you will recall, Dr. Brown did give a presentation on student performance in Baltimore County Public Schools. This is not a repeat of that um, report. Instead, uh, this information is being provided tonight as information on what's to come in terms of the state's accountability system. Uh, so I wanted, uh, I asked Dr. Brown to come forward so that the public and the board would be informed about the new um, accountability system uh, by the state of Maryland. So, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair Stewart. Uh, Superintendent White, members of the board and community. Pleased to be here this evening to, again, give an overview of the new uh, Maryland report card that will be coming out in December and how that is gonna work uh, for BCPS schools. So as I go through this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the accountability model as a whole, what, what's in it. I'm gonna talk about the purpose of the county, why we have report cards, what they do for us. Uh, and then I'm gonna spend a, the lion's share of the time talking about how the report cards are gonna look, uh, the various components for those in the elementary, middle, and high school levels as we go through it, and what things that they'll tell us about those schools as we, we get those cards in. So when we think about accountability, we think about the purposes of accountability, uh, probably the most important driver for that is supporting equitable outcomes for all children, irrespective of race, social economic status, et cetera. They're a means for us to, to be able to measure uh, whether or not we're raising student achievement and closing gaps in achievement over time for students. They are a key tool for doing that for us and communicating those results to our community. They also provide a common means of evaluating schools so that we have a common ruler when we think about looking at elementary schools across the state or middle schools across the state, high schools, et cetera. It's a common way, a common rubric for looking at schools around the, the state of Maryland. In that, once we've looked at schools, it obviously it gives us an opportunity then to look at schools that need some help and ways that we can support that and then also measure whether or not those supports have been effective over time. And one of the things that I like about this model is that it's more holistic. Uh, if you go back to No Child Left Behind, there was an extreme emphasis on just reading and mathematics, whereas with, when you look at this, this also includes some other dimensions of school quality. Uh, the lion's share of the, of the report card is still tied to student achievements, student and academic outcomes, but it does allow for other things that, that tell us something about the quality of the school environment. And all of the above is being driven by uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015, and it's Maryland's response to that. So when we look at this, uh, there's common framework uh, to these and some, some aspects that are common to all. So if you look at the top three, academic achievement, progress in, in achieving English language proficiency, and school quality and success are true in all levels of the report card. So you'll see that in the elementary level, the middle school level, and the high school level. There are three areas that are, are distinct though and depend on level. And so if you look at academic progress, which measures growth, how much does a student learn from one year to the next, that is particular to elementary and middle schools, whereas graduation rate and readiness for post-secondary success are, are unique to the high school model. Common, again, across all of these, Again, the lion's share of the points, the lion's share of what we look at for a school is connected to academic indicators. 65% of the points that are attributable to a building, irrespective of level, elementary, middle, or high, are attributable to academic indicators, whereas 35% are connected to measures of school quality and student success. 
So let's take a look at these. Let's start with elementary and middle schools. Elementary and middle schools have quite a lot of overlap in terms of how the report cards are going to look, and so we can go through them sort of um, step by step to look at the components. I'm going to work through this model from left to right, uh, and we're going to start with the academic indicators and starting specifically with academic achievement. Academic achievement accounts for about 20 points in the model at the elementary and middle school levels. Half of that is tied to student proficiency in reading and mathematics. So that is the proportion of students who score four or five on PARC. The other half is connected to the average PARC performance level. So as we're aware, uh, we, we often talk about four or five as proficient on PARC. But there are three other performance levels, so performance level one, two, and three that precede that uh, as students become closer and closer to career and college ready. This um, other half of this gives the average performance level at a building. So it looks at every student's test in reading and mathematics and looks at the average performance level across the building. Moving over to the next component, and that's um, progress, academic progress, and this is a measure of student growth, and there are a couple components to that. The first, uh, which carries the lion's share of this, carries 25 points. It's uh, tied to student growth. And um, it's measured using something called a student growth percentile, and it sounds pretty fancy, and there's some, some interesting math behind that. But it really, uh, for those of us who've had children or have had, um, you know, taken children to the doctor when they're, when they're growing, we, we measure them against growth charts, et cetera, and we have some sense of where they're at at a point in time and whether or not they change over time. In, in like fashion, this works this way. For, so for students who have a particular score in a given year, historically, say I have a 402. In the coming year, how do I perform relative to my peers? Did I grow more or did I grow less? If I grew more, I've demonstrated more growth. You know, if you think about the height chart, I'm a little taller than maybe what folks expected. If I grew less, maybe, I, again, I didn't keep up on the height weight chart that, that we expected when we started. And this is a way, to, again, to benchmark growth and, and to understand whether or not students are making growth that's comparable to their peers, comparable to students who had like scores. The other component of this constitutes 10 points, and it's broken up into a couple parts. The parts that are in dark blue are parts that are in place this year. The parts that are in light blue won't be in place until the tests are available. So about half of this is uh, for the elementary schools is connect, connected to completing a well-rounded uh, curriculum. Students who've been able to be successful in reading, math, science, and social studies and, and have passed those classes. The other half of that for an elementary student is passing a science test. That science test wasn't available last year. It will be available this year and will be part of the model this year. For middle school students, on the other hand, it's 3% for, for completing that curriculum. The other components are tied to science and social studies. And again, the science test will come into play this year and social studies will come in subsequently to that. Finally, uh, the, the last indicator in the, in the academic indicator component is uh, proficiency in English language and the acquisition of English language over time. We know that in Baltimore County and across the country we have a growing number of English language learners and for those buildings that serve English language learners, this gives a measure that allows us to know whether or not students are acquiring English quickly enough to be able to be placed into a curriculum without supports. And the expectation here is that, that within six years of the first time a student takes a, a measure of English language proficiency, they will be proficient in that language. And these are incremental goals then based on when the student entered the country and their English language proficiency and holds us accountable to making sure that students acquire English and can perform in our classrooms. Moving on to the other 35% of the model, again, looking at school quality and student success. 10% of that, or 10 points in this model, are opportunities to have access to a well-rounded curriculum. And you can see in elementary school, here it's, again, the opportunity to, to have a, a well-rounded curriculum. In the prior section, it was not just the opportunity to have, you also had to complete and be successful in that curriculum. In this case, it's the opportunity to participate in it. The same is true for middle school. You can see the range of courses that are involved in that. 
The other two components are chronic absenteeism. We all know that attendance is incredibly important, and when kids are chronically absent, it compromises their ability to learn. And this indicator, 15 points, is, is connected uh, to whether or not students are, are attending school and attending regularly. There will be a climate survey, and that will be implemented this year. And again, it's a light blue component in the PowerPoint because it's something that's not part of this year's report card, but will be part of the report card next year. As we move on and we talk about high schools, the high school models, as I go through it, I'm not going to belabor all the things that are the same. I'm just going to focus on the things that are different. And so we'll start with, again, the academic indicators for this. Again, academic indicators take up 65% of the model. And uh, when we look at achievement, relative to the elementary and middle schools, a little bit heavier weight in high school for this. So 30 points uh, are allocated for academic achievement at the high school level, and again, tied to park proficiency in ELA and mathematics, and broken out in a similar fashion to the elementary and middle. Obviously, graduation rate remains important. It is something that gets put in, and it is a little different than the past, in that 10% of, of the points, or 10 points in the model, are allocated for a four-year graduation rate, four-year on-time graduation. This is something that's very familiar to us. But they've also all allocated five points in this model for students who graduate within five years. And again, this is one of the components of this model that I really like because it affords us an opportunity to close the gap with, with kids who are close at, at the end of four years. And it also is one that is particularly useful, I think, for our English learners who often need more than four years to be able to successfully complete the curriculum for high school. We're going to skip over English language proficiency because, frankly, it's the same at the high school level as it was at the elementary and middle school levels. But we will go on to readiness for, for post-secondary success. And again, this uh, ties into something that we've already been doing. If we look at the 5% uh, from being on, on track in, for ninth grade. We have been using on track indicators uh, in high school uh, for four or five years at least as a means to be able to understand where kids are on their pathway to graduation and understanding where we need to intervene and intervene in a timely fashion to ensure that kids can get across this age. This is a forward or leading indicator uh, that the state has built into the model to ensure that kids get off to a good start in high school and therefore are afforded opportunities to, to be able to do additional things while they're in high school. To that end, they give us an opportunity here for kids to complete a well-rounded curriculum, and it gives us five, again, five points uh, towards this for kids who, you know, frankly, um, are able to ob obtain that gift with purchase. Our superintendent often talks about gift with purchase. And so for those students who are able to walk away with the hi from high school with some other credential, I've been able to complete a an AP course and score three or above on an AP exam. I've walked away with a credential. I've walked away with CT. So the last time I was here and I was talking about some of our student achievements, we talked about CT credit and the way kids have been moving forward. Again, within this model, uh, the state has been forward thinking, talking about what it means for post-secondary success. And the graduation's a nice first step towards this, but we really want to talk about those other things that students can do. And again, this portion gives students credit for that when they have accomplished this. Finally, we're going to look at the uh, school quality and student success indicators at the end, because they do differ a little bit for high school from the uh, elementary and middle. Again, we talked about access to a well-rounded curriculum. So a moment ago, I was talking about the gifts with purchase. Well, that's successful completion of. This gives us credit for getting more students into rigorous uh, opportunities. So affording more AP opportunities, affording more IB opportunities, getting more students. It incentivizes getting students into pathways where they can be credentialed. Students have to have those opportunities first if they're ever going to be able to accomplish them in the end. So if we put this all together, elementary, middle, or high school, uh, they're going to come out in report cards, and those report cards are, do have some summative numbers associated with them. There are three main summary numbers that, that come with those. Uh, for each school, there will be a total number of points earned, and that total number of points earned will be compared to the possible number of points that could be earned at that building. There's some variance in that. As I mentioned, there are some things that are missing this year. Elementary, middle, and high school, there won't be a survey this year. 
that comes into the next year. For our elementary and middle schools, we do not have science tests. The points associated with that science test won't be in place until next year. For middle schools, social studies will not come into place into the coming year. So the maximum number of points available varies. At high school, it's 90. In middle school, it's 83. And at elementary, it's 85. Based on the number of points earned, uh, there's a star rating associated with each building. And that, that is points earned v, uh, versus the points available at a building. It's that proportion. And that, that drives a star rating. I'll bring up a chart here in a moment. And ultimately, then, there will also be a percentile performance associated with that. How did my school do with likes in comparison to like schools around the, the state? So as an elementary school, how did my elementary school compare to other elementary schools around the state, middle school, high school, et cetera? The star ratings that I mentioned, um, you'll see they, they pop up in the right-hand corner. Uh, so a building will get a star rating. Right below that is the percentile rank. And at the bottom, in the, in the blue, you see there's the ratio there that gives you the proportion of points earned for a building. The star ratings are driven uh, by a formula uh, or, or a framework which was determined by the State Board of Education in October. So a lot of these things, frankly, were determined well after the completion of the school year. It is one of the things that I actually find very frustrating, that our, our teachers and our buildings are being measured by a model that was determined after they had performed instead of prior to. So in many respects, they didn't know where these lines were going to be drawn uh, for accountability purposes until after they had already done their work. So you can see for the star ratings, um, there's a breakdown. To get five stars, you have to earn at least 75% or more of the total uh, points available at a building. For some of you, that may not sound like a lot. You know, I, you know, I think about 75% and I think, oh, well, you know, that sort of sounds like a C. Well, yeah, the test is pretty hard. The, the expectations are very difficult. And when we look statewide, if I look at what they took to the Board of Education at the state level, there were only 16 middle schools in the state that scored more than 75% of their points. It's a very rigorous bar. It may not appear to be, but it, the, the task that's asked of the schools is, is very rigorous. And so you see the cut points, and the cut points were actually determined vis-a-vis -vis looking at the data and where the percentiles fell out for the state, elementary, middle, and high school. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions if I haven't put everybody to sleep yet. We should have had some turkey at that time. It would help. Do we have questions or apparently comments? Very good. Dr. Brown, thank you for the presentation. I just had a question on the star rating. You talked about how it will be based on the points available for that building. So does that mean um, it's going to vary building to building as far as a child's performance could end up with one star rating versus another, or is this a building-wide rating? The star ratings are, are absolutely a building-level rating, and I, I really appreciate that clarification. We're not going to be applying stars to children. <laughs> this is a building-level rating, and there are some cases, and, and I'll uh, sort of default to the uh, acquisition of English, for example. So if we have a building where there are no English learners, well, that's worth 10 points. And those 10 points wouldn't be available at that building because there are no students for that measure. So it would come out. And so if it was an elementary building, instead of having 85 available points, they'd have 75. And the math would be done vis-a-vis -vis the 75. So it's in that regard, it's common sense. If you don't have students who are measured by that measure, then you don't include it. So the math would be done vis-a-vis -vis that factor. You're saying basically whether they've met the four-star rating or you know a lower star rating will be taken into account given that they didn't have the points in the first place. Absolutely. The entire it's proportion will adjust. It's already uh, adjusted in the math. Yeah. And could you explain what other kinds of things factor into the points available at a school? That was what I just went through. So you've got the, the academic indicators, which are reading and mathematics predominantly. Uh, for the, you have for elementary and middle schools, it's academic growth. Also, again, completion of a well-rounded curriculum. No, I mean, like you, you had just mentioned, um, you know, whether there were ESOL students or things like that, what, what other kinds of factors 
like that as far as, I guess they're just based on the composition of the student body in some cases, is that, is that the case? This, the cleanest example that I can think of where something might not be factored, factored into a building has to do with specifically English learners. That is the most likely pool of points that will come out of the model. Um, there are criteria for inclusion based on the number of students who are in a building, um, if there are 10 or more students at a building, so therefore, if you have 10 or more students who have been at the building for an academic year, everything else counts. So I'm having a hard time thinking of when other things would likely come out of the model. The other things that I pointed out that aren't in the model right now, science tests, social studies tests, and, this, and the survey from the state, because those simply haven't been administered. So those are the components that I anticipate to be missing. Okay, so. thank you. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that presentation. So for the uh, holistic component of the climate survey, mm -hmm. is that a state-developed climate survey that is issued statewide? Yes. Okay, and do, it, do we, do they have that designed already? They have it designed and they did some pilot work this fall with that, that survey. Okay, and so at what point would we be administering that climate survey to our students? We would anticipate administering that survey in the spring. Uh, again, contingent on the state's ability to deliver the, the survey. Okay. So. Is that something that can be um, the current design of it um, given to the new board just in a weekly update down the road? This survey? Mm -hmm. Just a link to it. Or do you have it? No. Or they haven't, they've designed a pilot, but they haven't designed the actual. They, they've designed it and, and it's secure. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so we uh, can't see it ahead of, even right. the board can't see it ahead right. of time. I haven't seen it ahead of time. So. Okay, all right, well thank so. you for clarifying that. Comments, Qu Mr. McDaniels? Uh, a question and a comment. I was yeah. going to ask Dr. Brown, you have a, a good sense, I believe, of BCPS and its um, strengths and weaknesses, I guess, and um, I know we do some things very well, I would think, in the graduation rate, we seem to perform well. And looking at these measurements, where do you see our greatest opportunity uh, for progress forward or things that we uh, may not be doing as well as we would like in terms of how we're going to be measured with this tool? Sure. So um, the last time I was here before you and, and talked about student achievement, um, the one clear area that we, we spoke about is, a, and, and we're actually going to be bringing a um, a proposal forward to the board for an audit uh, of is the math curriculum. I mean, we, we've there is a real opportunity to to have improvement there, and we've committed to. We've gone through an RFP process, and we'll be bringing a contract forward to the board uh, for a group to come in and help us audit and, and understand strengths and weaknesses of math curriculum because there's a clear area for need for improvement there. Thank you. In addition uh, to that, I would also see an opportunity when it comes to our English learners mm. and our student achievement around that. And so we're always looking at ways to um, close those gaps in achievement as well. But uh, as Dr. Brown said, I've gone on record saying that we know that we have um, those greatest opportunities in our math uh, curriculum. And I believe that the math audit will give us information on how we can improve in that area. Thank you. And I guess my comment was um, a challenge that I've recognized as a board member in um, when we do redistricting. Mm -hmm. We have a good pro uh, problem in Baltimore County that we have a growing population and we sometimes build new schools. And um, I was just thinking of a scenario where we have four schools and three of them are four star and one of them's a two or a one. The challenge of mm -hmm. having a family or a parent be moved from a four to it. Do, do we have, is that a new problem that we're going to have or are our schools rated in such a tangible manner now that we have the same problem? But I, I um, just know how I would feel as a parent and you're going to move me from a four star to a one or two star. It, I mean, is that, a, is that going to be a new problem that we're introducing? So in my, my experience with boundaries, I do not believe this will be a new problem. I, I think okay. yeah. uh, our, our community often... Um, they assign their own stars, I they, guess. Exactly. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, I just had two questions. One was, Dr. Brown, you talked about uh, enrollment and also opportunities for access to programs. It sounds like it's not just about really whether we offer the program at that school, it's about how many people are taking advantage of it. Absolutely. Okay, so that's yeah. the metric. So yeah, the metric, I mean, if you think about it, particularly for high school, um, if folks are gonna walk away from high school with some other certification, we have to, we, I mean, again, I'm gonna go with the gift with purchase metaphor. You have to at least let them in the store. So they have to be in an AP class, they have to be in a CT track, they have to at least have the opportunity to be able to get that certification. So the model, I think, incentivizes that leading indicator, which is getting people into the more rigorous pathway, and also then incentivizes based on the, the folks who successfully complete and, and obtain. Right, but in other words, though, it's even more incumbent upon us to ensure that our students understand and are aware of the opportunities before them. Absolutely. Right. And then secondarily, uh, I noticed a number of references to Park. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how the evolution of that issue is affecting this? So um, I was really trying not to do that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, um, a lot of this, the decisions around the composition of this, the business rules, I frankly just got a publication of the business rules this week. Mm -hmm. So being able to really understand in a very concrete way the math under this um, came together late. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, the star assignment method was determined in October, less than a month ago. <laughs> so some pretty core components of this model were built while the plane was in flight. This is another one. If we change the assessment, um, I, I am concerned about what that will mean for measurements of student achievement and how those will be equated as one moves from one assessment to another. Uh, there was little or no evidence when PARC came into play that we were ab even able to account for equating for the difference between a paper form of the test and an electronic form of the test, shifting from one measure to another and trying to equate five different performance levels is ambitious for even the best test developer. Which in, in part means it is tough indeed to be able to discern what that right level or goal line should be, what that average metric should be, given we're still getting our feet underneath us on what this test really means. My concern is that when the new test comes out, this will effectively require at least two years to, to set another Right rate. size, the level, yeah. Sure, Mr. Yofflader. Um Dr. Brown, relative to high schools and magnet programs and magnet high schools, how is that going to fit into the equation? So, uh, well, well, you said accomplishments or, or, right. or preparing, uh, many of them have, do have certi programs with, that have certifications. Does that tilt it one way or the other? Or, Well, one would expect that in, in schools where you have a specialized program that allows students to walk with, with some sort of certification, be, again, uh, multiple AP opportunities, IB curriculum, certifications. Schools with a larger repertoire of those are gonna have uh, greater opportunities for students to be able to um, earn those gifts with purchase and be able to, to demonstrate those points on, on the report card as well. So. Scozzi. One of the slides back that one of the criteria was a graduation rate. Mm -hmm related to the high school programs. So does the state differentiate between our students that graduate completing all requirements originally versus those that use a bridge program or that use credit recovery? Um, and do our students, when they use credit recovery, is there a notation about how many times they attempted that? Or is it just crossing the goal line the, the, state does, the, the state does not differentiate between whether or how students meet their criteria for graduation. Okay. And then um, it's my understanding that there's ESSA requirements around GT, but I didn't see that in, in this component. So is it, is it in there somewhere or is that in another area? So I went through the sort of the 
large picture piece of this. Uh, there is a component of the report card that disaggregates the data. Um, it doesn't have any weighting the, it, as it would have had it maybe in the NCLB terms. It is just a report of disaggregated performance by subgroups, and GT will be one of those subgroups. Okay, that's great to know that. Um, and so those reports are evaluated at the same time as the stars are applied? And it's, it's all part of the same report. Okay. Um, and so when you're talking about disaggregated there, results. And by the way, there's some work to be done there in terms of having a common understanding state. And that's in the works too. Work to be done at the state level to mm -hmm. set criteria that's right. consistent amongst the LEAs. Yeah, so when we, yes. you know, one of the things I led with on the, on the front end is, is when accountability systems work well, it's really nice to have a common rubric and a common ruler to look at schools across the entire state. And to that, you have to have common definitions to start with. And this is one where we don't, and we need the state to lean in on. Well, that'll be good. Yeah. I mean, so we'll continue to watch them work. Um, so when you're talking about disaggregated data, there will also be uh, special components for special ed? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Yell. Going back to um, the... No, I'm feeling like I'm getting the lion's share of the time tonight. You know, you guys with the CAFR could have spoken with them. <laughs> Once again, you're welcome. <laughs> so what you're saying is you're not appreciative of all our, our attention? <laughs> I, I love the attention that I'm getting. I, and I, I, I'm not getting that impression. You're appreciative <laughs> of our attention. It's that nobody really wants to leave the board. Uh -huh. I, you know, I could understand that. Okay, going back to graduation, and there were points, um, if I remember correctly, 10 points for four-year graduation, five points for five-year. So our students that um, have summer graduation, where, what are they considered? They're, well, the lion's share of those students would be within the four-year. Uh, sometimes students who are completing the summer graduation actually could be in a different cohort. Uh, but we're talking about, when we talk about fifth-year graduation, it would be students who go on into that fifth year. As long as uh, folks complete during the summer and prior to the start of the new school year, they come as part of the prior cohort. Okay, thank you. Yep. Just a quick comment. A quick comment. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. I just want to take a second to thank Dr. Brown and his team. Again, I know that you just, we just uh, received a lot of this information not too long ago, um, but we certainly wanted the, the board and certainly the public to be fully informed about what's to come and uh, the new accountability system, so we wanted to provide that type of information. So thank you, Dr. Brown, for your work. Ms. Causey. Ms. White, is the PowerPoint going to be available now on board docs because I, it wasn't sure. available earlier? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So we proceed to item M, which is board member comments. For some of us, this will be our last set of board member comments. Um, we started, I think, with Mr. Young last time around. So Ms. Miller, would you kick it off for us? Yes, thank you. I actually gave my parting comments at the last meeting, which I also posted on my Facebook page if anybody's interested, BCPS board member Ann Miller. But I just wanted to add a, a thought. Um, I wanted to thank all of the uh, stakeholders and advocates who have been uh, so encouraging to me throughout my term and also uh, expressed such kind words regarding my um, leaving the board um, and uh, I just wanted to assure you that I will not be far away. I plan on staying involved and um, helping the new board to transition in um, and continue as an education advocate alongside with the rest of you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Well, I'll keep mine short and sweet. I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Look forward to seeing you all in December. Good evening. Let's see how little of a contrast I can, uh, or how much of a contrast I'll make to Ms. Hen. Um, I just want to say I really enjoyed American Education Week, and I regret that the snowstorm took one of our days away, but I do want to compliment our staff on making the absolute right call of canceling school on Thursday, because we did, in fact, get 
more snow, uh, certainly in northern areas of the county and around uh, than was originally expected. So I appreciate the prudence with which um, our staff has made those decisions, um, but I did uh, regret that I did miss the Thanksgiving feast that uh, our nutrition folks, food and nutrition folks, work very hard on making for our students. Um, I am looking forward to Thanksgiving, and I hope that uh, we all get to take time to enjoy family and friends and truly reflect on our many blessings uh, here in Baltimore County, in the great state of Maryland, and in our wonderful country. Um, I also made many comments last week that people could go back and watch the meeting, so in brevity, but I am very grateful for our community. I've really enjoyed the last three and a half years on the board working, meeting, uh, as Mr. Melia said, meeting so many people around the county, around the state that really have the best interest of the students at heart. And even though many people may differ in how we can achieve outcomes, we really are looking for the best outcomes for all of our students. So I appreciate all of the uh, support that I've received and also constructive con uh, cr criticism along the way. Um, and I do wanna say too, I'm really looking forward and really hopeful to working with the new board members. I've had the opportunity to speak with most of the newly elected board members. The snow day uh, put a crimp in one of my plans. Um, and I'm just really hopeful. The energy, the dedication, the different perspectives that are available, I think it's going to be a very um, engaging and energetic um, process. We are going to have to learn together and get to know each other and come together and work with uh, administration and staff. So I'm very hopeful. Um, and we really have a lot of things coming up right in front of us, but I do believe that we will be able one by one to analyze those issues, to really question the options that we have in front of us and then come to consensus for what's gonna be best for our students, which means taking care of our teachers and all of our staff that work so hard and are really dedicated to them. So thank you very much and hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm sitting here trying to reflect and uh, what comes to mind is the fact that as we, trans as we go through life, we, we come to uh, different uh, scenarios. Uh, we, perhaps we change professions or uh, we change direction. And I gotta tell you, as I told one of my partners of almost 60 years, we had a great run. Uh, ten and a half years have been a tremendous learning experience for me. Um, it, it's really uh, quite a large system, so much to learn, so much to understand, and uh, you must look at the system as a whole. If you start picking away at little pieces, considering the size of the system, you don't accomplish anything. One other thing, uh, over this period of time, I have met and, and regard as, as persons that, that I really admire our staff. And I'm going from Mrs. White right on down to the school bus drivers, attendants, and what have you. We have a fantastic administrative staff, and they are most committed, and I think that there's about the tops that you're going to find in every one of their particular, particularly uh, what they do. So I thank you, and I appreciate it, and perhaps um, I, I may still stay involved. I will stay involved. I, I am on the advisory board of CTE, and um, in, in reviewing what the, the CTE advisory board has done, uh, there's a lot of room uh, for uh, presentations to get the board and the public fully aware of our CTE program, which is growing every year and is one of the uh, major, I think, pushes at the federal level as well. At least all the educators seem to think how important it's going to be. So I'm going to stay involved in that and um, I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Um, it's been a real pleasure for me to serve on the Baltimore County Board of Education for the last six years. I've had the pleasure of serving along with others who were passionate about enhancing the educational opportunities for our students and providing the optimal resources for the teachers and administrators of BCPS. As uh, Mr. Yulfelder just said, I believe also that we are very fortunate in Baltimore County to have such a talented and capable staff directing our programs throughout our system, and it's been very uplifting to just be a part of the team. I'm also optimistic about the future of BCPS as the newly elected board members assume their positions next month. 
I think that BCAPS will benefit by their renewed energy that they bring, their new perspectives, and a new opportunity to work together productively. I also feel strongly that we have the best person in our superintendent to provide stability for our system during this coming year of extreme transition and board leadership. Ms. White has demonstrated the ability to stay focused on initiatives that will improve student learning in the midst of many distractions from outside influences. She also has the support of our talented educators in the schoolhouse, which is critical for success. Lastly, my word for the future is that the board and the staff always give priority to our most important and primary function, and that is to enhance the academic outcomes of our students. As an engineer, I've stressed the importance of having metrics associated with our educational initiatives and assuring that we're good stewards of the monies that are contributed to education by our state and local government. I've heard routinely from board members recently about uh, performing cost analysis benefit for certain resources used in education. This along with my own thinking has caused me to reflect by a, on a statement by my former board seatmate Ed Parker. He emphasized that the money spent on education is better considered as an investment than a cost. I also thought of the comment by Dr. Morrison from Johns Hopkins when he asked how you assess a value or benefit of providing technology and access to information to a student living in poverty whom otherwise wouldn't have it. What value or benefit do we assign to providing the tools for a visually impaired student to comprehend texts of various types? How do you measure the benefit of providing educational tools to English language learners to help them better integrate into our school community? The cost of not investing in education sh sh sometimes shows up in unemployment, incarceration, generational poverty, and other social ills. Many times, I believe the value of our educational investment is priceless. Stay focused on student achievement and all that supports the enhanced learning in our classroom. Keep the main thing the main thing. Thank you. Thank you, good Stuart. Uh, <laughs> um, my remarks will focus on, um, as oftentimes in the past, our students and our staff uh, with the abbreviated uh, um, uh, American Education Week due to the weather. I wasn't able to go to all three of the schools that I had attended um, uh, for 11 years anyway, because there was that, that, that annexing over to Victory Villa for a year, which was a cool year, but really, you know. Um, so I wasn't able to go to Kenwood, but I wanted to let all of you know that uh, I was pleased to read as a former Kenwood lacrosse player that Alisa Griever has signed with the Division II School for lacrosse um, at the University of Charleston. And she signed a letter of intent, so uh, she will be uh, taking her extraordinary lacrosse skills to the University of Charleston. And at Kenwood, IB students, international baccalaureate students, are applying to colleges. One asked me to write a recommendation uh, to an Ivy League college, to several Ivy League colleges. So uh, I wish all those uh, IB students, because there clearly are uh, new chapters being written in all of our all of our schools, especially schools that serve our sixth district. And two I was able to attend included Stemmers Run Middle School. Brian Thanner was able to escort me around. Um, if you uh, have an interest in, in IB, no, and this board, in fact, uh, supported the magnet, uh, receiving the magnet grants for uh, middle school magnets. Uh, the IB magnet at um, uh, our Stemmers Run is being promoted uh, very strongly by uh, the staff at Stemmers Run. Everywhere you go, there are signs uh, with kids in them and whatnot about the IV program. Um, and if you go into the stairwells in a few months, you'll see um, really huge murals that will be uh, singing the praises of, of IB. Uh, I was able to meet the three music teachers at the school. The arts are really well at Stemmers Run. And um, two, uh, two art teachers, uh, one of whom uh, not only teaches art, but also does dance. Dance in um, uh, what uh, was really sort of a two classroom area when I was a student, uh, sort of in the back part of the school. Um, but um, some folks have been in from our system to look it over to perhaps 
converted into a dance studio proper with uh, changing rooms and a proper floor. And I see Kevin Smith taking notes, and I hope that he will take extensive notes because this looks like an ideal special project, and I, I bring that to the attention of our very uh, hardworking and um, uh, people and student-oriented, especially superintendents, so that we can get that dance program move, moving forward. I almost jumped in with the kids, but I, I would have had to take off my boots, you know. Um, uh, the school also just has so many good things going on there. If you have a chance, stop in at Stemmer's Run. Um, the Maryland State Department of Education did in what it used to be the wood and metal shops. Those are now sort of design classrooms, and MSD took a look at them. And I hope I'm not giving anything away, but don't be surprised if our Stemmer's Run receives an Engineering Excellence Award um, uh, in the spring. But uh, if they do, then you can say that you, you heard it here first. And uh, if you want to take a look at a really, really cool elementary school, uh, it is our Hawthorne Elementary School. As you walk up the sidewalk to enter the school, there is a Virtues Metal Sculpture Garden. And uh, among uh, the benevolent statue, uh, the sculptures, there is a sculpture for uh, responsibility. And you can look at that and draw your own uh, impressions about it. Inside the school, and of course I was there on a Friday, schools were closed on Thursday, and that's when the big Thanksgiving kind of meal would have been served for lunch. And so uh, it was served on Friday and I wanted to see the kids kind of doing the the pad because it's one of the free you know it's free lunches there for kids all the kids get free ones but they all put in their pin numbers and uh, there were a lot of leftovers it was a fantastic meal and the ladies behind the counter wanted to make sure that we didn't like waste waste these leftovers so I uh, had to have my arm twisted but I did help them out a little bit and in the cafeteria the music teacher was DJing so the kids were eating this big Thanksgiving meal and then they were out there kind of like dancing and boogieing and having just having a grand time and uh, it was also grandparents day so the grandparents were kind of moving in and out with the kids um, and if you as I say if you have the chance come to Hawthorne Elementary School, a lot of very good things going on. There is the Judy Center that is uh, operating there, which is helping track our kids to make sure that they come to school uh, school ready. Uh, we have a PhD that works with it and also a social worker. And you're beginning to see the results of the, of the good work that's being done at Hawthorne in the kindergarten readiness, readiness assessment tests or, or assessments that are conducted because the Judy schools collect additional data that isn't normally available at, at our other schools, and uh, the results are very, very positive for what's going on there. The school, because of changes in Title I dollars and how you can spend them, the school now uh, has a full social worker at the school, so now really you have, you have two social workers, and they also have um, uh, two counselors. Strike that. I think this, um, the, the school also has two counselors and, and the social worker. So you have the two social workers, one from the Judy Center, one that's a full time, and then you have the two counselors. And the beauty of the counselors is that they can tag team off and on. There are some things that kids present with that have to be dealt with immediately, which takes that, that counselor out of the school, and uh, out of the school classroom, rather. And then that means that what would have happened that day with a student counselor, school counselor in one of those classrooms can't happen. But with uh, having two, you now have the uh, ability to have uh, that other school counselor go in and do good things. So those are three schools, uh, Kenwood, Stemmer's Run, and Hawthorne, all three which serve our students in our sixth district. And if your schedules permit, I encourage all of you to stop by and see the good things in what is really an excellent school system that is constantly striving to improve and to work on the things that we, that we didn't get just right and to change gears when we note, like with math, that we need to change gears. And we've been doing it since the mid-1800s, and in the 21st century, the challenges don't change. The kids just present with more of them. And that's my opinion. Thank you so much. I'm glad you weren't long. I wasn't. <laughs> you told me it wasn't gonna be long. And you believed it. No. <laughs> He's He's okay. I'd like to start off with a passage from Lauren Isley. One day a man was walking along the beach when he noticed a figure in the distance. As he got closer, he realized the figure was that of a boy picking something up and gently throwing it into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, what are you doing? The youth replied, throwing a starfish into the ocean. The sun is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they will die. Son, the man said, don't you realize there are miles and miles of beach 
and hundreds of starfish, you can't possibly make a difference. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, and threw it into the surf. Then smiling at the man, he said, I made a difference for that one. I too would like to believe that I made a difference as a member of the Baltimore County School Board. It may not have been a substantial difference, but hopefully I made a difference to some. I like to believe that after serving for three and a half years, some positive changes took place. I realized that everyone on the board did what they thought was the best, they did what was in the best interest of the school students and the school system as a whole. It was an honor and a privilege to serve on the board. I would like to thank Mrs. White and all of her staff for always answering my phone calls, emails, and texts. Whenever a situation arose, they were there with sound advice, always keeping the students in the forefront of their minds. As a board member, I tried to make decisions that would benefit the entire school community. I am most proud of approving the budget for new school constructions, especially for Dundalk, Colgate, and Berkshire Elementary Schools. I would get to see the, the completion of these schools since I live in a neighborhood. Please invite me to the ribbon cutting ceremonies. I wish all my fellow board members good health and happiness. I pray that the new board works cooperatively with each other and with school staff. And for the last time, I would like to say I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Young. Ms. White, please clear your calendar for tomorrow since I'm gonna come in and have a long discussion about Dr. Brown and his um, <laughs> lack of desire for attention, okay? Well, you're still a board member until the third, <laughs> so you're good. Uh, no, in all seriousness, um, I wish everybody a happy and safe holiday. You know, enjoy, enjoy the time you get to spend with your family uh, this weekend. And good night. Hold on. Brevity is the soul of wit. All right. Ms. White. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I just I know that I gave my comments the last at the last meeting, so I won't be long. I just want to say thank you again um, to our board members um, for the time that you have put into your service. Um, and when I say service, I do believe in service uh, and servant leadership. And so you've put service. Um, before politics, you've put your service before your personal agendas. And so I just want to say how much I appreciate that. And I just look forward to um, still connecting uh, with many of you. And so thank you for um, your advocacy. And Ms. Eaton, I, I agree. Um, as a board, you have made a difference in the lives of children, and you've made a lot. You've made a difference in terms of um, how you've governed this uh, school system. It is not easy work; it is hard work. And so, I just want to thank you for the time and effort that you've put in to this work. And for all of the incoming board members, I do look forward to working directly with you, getting to know you. And I want to thank you for choosing um, public education for. Uh, figuratively speaking, kind of raising your hands uh, to do this very important work for our children, um, doing this uh, work for public education. And so thank you for raising your hand to do that, and I look forward to working with you and to all of our staff and to all of our community members. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Very good. All right, so I have the honor of closing out our term of service as a board with a few remarks. Um, buckle up. They're a little bit long. Uh, for starters, I'll acknowledge the service uh, of Mr. Hayden and Mr. Gillis, who couldn't be here. It's quite a commitment on their part. Uh, although, Dr. Frone, you may have outlasted both of those board members. Uh, I'd like to touch on the results of this board's work and offer a few thoughts on the next chapter in the story of our system, BCPS. Last time, you'll have to hear a soliloquy from me, but uh, I'm still going to try to be brief, and I'm not actually going to be brief. Uh, I'm proud to say through countless long nights and work sessions and emails and phone calls that we've all had, we've, we've taken some real and substantial steps for our children. The work of the board is far more than what graces our 24-hour news cycle or the ill-informed blogosphere. And contrary to certain comments, we are far more, in my opinion, than just watchdogs whose purpose is to play a perpetual game of gotcha. I think it's about progress. It's about doing. And because of those on our board, 
that were willing to collaborate all together and with our staff, we were able to, on academic achievement and equity, we were able to close the achievement gap between our black and white students. We were able to increase graduation rates each year from 2014 to 2017, which exceeded the statewide average. We expanded access to devices and fidelity to our values of equity and achievement, and we made a demonstrable impact in Lighthouse Schools. On facilities, we approved in new schools all throughout our county, including Lansdowne High and Delaney High, and delivered new schools and additions all throughout our county. We initiated the first ever 10 years facility plan for the system, which would be less vulnerable to politicking and infighting. We started the life-giving community school model, which provides wraparound services such as healthcare and GED and English as the second language to the entire community. This board did that. On the needs of the whole child, we better met the needs of the whole child with the division of school climate and safety with new social workers and counselors and psychologists and pupil personnel workers. We expanded access to free meals throughout Baltimore County with the Baltimore County Cares for Kids program. On college and career readiness, we created this new BCPS Works program, which includes a coordinator position to ensure our many college and career offerings are working together and to maximum effect. We founded our first P-TECH program at, Delaney, or I'm sorry, at Dundalk High School, where students will pursue an associate's degree uh, in engineering technology. And we also established additional magnet opportunities for international studies and health sciences. And on performance improvement and operations, Mr. McDaniels, we modernized our transportation system, GPS for buses, electronic routing system, improved radios, which in turn allowed us to start the, the uh, school day task force uh, to push school, star, school start times back. We stood up data dashboards with user-friendly interface to push and pull and aggregate and disaggregate data about key metrics. And we even enabled stakeholders to contact board members directly, which they couldn't do before. Um, however, notwithstanding this list, perhaps the most important thing we did was secure for our system two years of leadership uh, of Ms. Verlita White. And I think we made the right call in engaging her as our superintendent last year, and we made the right call this year, despite the state superintendent's unlawful intervention. And although Ms. White was a talented and strong leader back then, and although she had deep support from our community at that time, we have only seen those talents and that those talents and the leadership and the support within our system grow, and our system has been the beneficiary. We know that the accomplishments I just ticked off would not have been possible, but for her innovative thinking, her thoughtfulness, and her ability to execute. She engendered a level of support that has been unparalleled. I cribbed it before, but I think grit and grace are well said. And I have every confidence that she is the right person to lead our BCPS forward. And that's especially true given the transformative time we are entering, folks, with the Kerwin Commission and when it releases its report this January. This couldn't be a more exciting time for those of us who embrace progress, but we need the right leadership at the helm. And if we're gonna fully address our facilities issues, and if we're gonna truly support teachers and ensure teaching is understood in the same way as other high level professions like engineering or architecture or accounting, and thank you, Abby, for all of your work and your laser focus there. If we're going to substantively raise the level of achievement across all subjects while continuing to serve the needs of one of the most diverse systems in the nation, then I think we need Verlita White. And importantly, we need the team that stands behind her. So on that score, I have to say, I believe it would be a mistake for the new board to conduct a national search. But even if it does, my belief is that she will prevail because of who she is, provided the search, and here's the caution, and its significant expense aren't used as an artifice to force the hiring of someone, anyone, new, simply because we spent all this time and money doing the search. BCPS team, let's say a couple of words to you and your effort, your commitment to kids and to equity and your continued willingness to work with us even when we didn't always want to work with you. This consistently reminded me of the importance of service and of the change and how it is practically achieved each day through your choices and your sacrifices for our children. And that's, what I, that's when I think we're at our best, not when we're acting as noisy gongs trying to attract attention. It's in the back and forth and the push and pull where we roll up our sleeves and get down to work. But how does it happen? At least in my experience, what brings people together to advance those interests of kids is respect. It's mutual respect. It's a belief that at bottom, we all share the same desire to see students flourish. And so to our new board, I ask you to please come with the heart of service and belief in the noble calling of this work. What worked for me was having four or five big ticket items that I held to for those three and a half years, holding fast even when reacting to crises of the day, perceived or real. But 
Having big ideas is one thing, executing is another. And so if you really want something to get done, the reality is you're gonna have to find a way to work together and to work with the staff. If you believe that staff is in it for themselves or that they're here to serve themselves at the expense of kids or that they're just generally criminals, you will have squandered your chance to serve. And similarly, if you believe that you're far more expert on education than anyone else and that everyone else is here to serve you instead of kids, you have squandered your chance to serve. At the remembrance ceremony, I'm almost done, for board member Mike Bowler, Freeman Herbowski reminded us of the adage from Edward Murrow, who said that anyone who isn't confused doesn't really understand the situation. What Murrow was saying is that anyone who comes with all the answers probably doesn't have any of them. And the further away these folks get from a situation, the stronger they believe they have the perfect solution. So to our new board, if there's anything I ask as a parent with two kids soon to be in the system, and by the way, one more who's on the way, please come armed. Thanks. Please come armed with your beliefs and your policy priorities, but please also come armed with an open mind and a willingness to collaborate. So here's the closing. To our incredible teachers and administrators and staff, I know there's a significant level of apprehension associated with change and with this new board, and you're not alone. But I wanna remind you that we are a strong system and we will continue to succeed because each of you are a part of it. This fight for kids is a fight worth having and I encourage you to hang in there. We're behind you, our county executive elect is behind you, and so are the majority of Baltimore County citizens who want our schools to succeed, but who sometimes aren't as vocal as those who don't. Finally, it has been an honor serving with Mr. Gillis. Uh, I think he led this board through a very challenging time in a way that few could. Uh, and I will say, I grew up in Baltimore County Public Schools, and I love the audacious and bold way that we dive headlong into serving one of the most complex and talented and beautiful student populations in the country. This is what we do here. It has been the honor of my life, so thank you very much. And that concludes our work.